started? Sure. All right. So hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, this is a workshop talking about accessible course authoring and administration. This is Jeff Witt. Uh, he's an accessibility specialist at edX. And take it away, Jeff. Hello. So can everyone hear me? Now, this is going to be a little bit odd. Um, I can switch to the other mic if they need to. We're OK? All right. Yeah. How's this? Any better? How's this? Wow. All right, we'll do that. I'm Jeff Witt. I'm an accessibility specialist for edX. So used to be I was the edX accessibility guy. Now as part of 2U, there's a few people who do sort of what I do in the 2U organization, but still generally I'm the edX accessibility guy. I'm going to talk to you about running an accessibility course. I know some of you um, run an a course accessibly. I know some of you have expertise in this area too. Feel free to interrupt me and tell me I'm wrong or that you think there's a better way, or that you know, you've learned certain things here. We've got about 10 minutes of buffer in here for questions, but I think interactivity is good too, so you feel free to interrupt. Um, oh, there it is. Here's the agenda. Who are we talking about in terms of people with disabilities? Why do we do this? Um, what kinds of accessibility tools do these people use? Um, what is accessible content in practical terms? How do you do accessibility testing? I have some checklists that you can use to uh, make sure you've go, got all the, the bases covered. And when should this work be done? And how does that benefit in scaling this up beyond what we normally think about as, as accessibility services in higher education? So who, um, first I wanna emphasize, you already have in your courses today, people who have disabilities that you may not be aware of, um, but disabilities are prevalent enough in the general population that I'm sure that some people have some difficulty doing certain activities, whether or not they've shown themselves to you or not is um, kind of a separate issue. Let's talk about incidents. So our most recent data from 2015, 2016 show that about 12 to 13% of students coming into higher education in traditional higher education have a diagnosis of one sort or another. I'll talk about the numbers in a moment, but 12 or 13% is a pretty big number for the, the US. It's certainly bigger than it would have been when I was first going into college 30 years ago. Um, so there's been a big wave of diagnoses. Most of the increase in diagnoses have been around cognitive emotional disabilities. So the big four are dyslexia, depression, anxiety, and, and uh, autism. And <laughs> I'm going to get to it in a second. Um, so those ones uh, are things that affect your ability to get things done as well as your ability to get uh, to do the work. The other things like uh, hearing impairment, physical disabilities, um, vision impairment, the incidence has tended to remain constant over time, although colleges have uh, increased their openness to, um, to people with disabilities. So the, incre the incidence in courses or in, in higher ed may have increased um, somewhat, but the uh, wave of diagnoses in the last couple of decades is what has increased the, the prevalence num numbers that you see here. So the big groups again, uh, vision, we separate into blindness and low vision. Low vision mean, in most cases means uh, can read print visually uh, and blind I think of as can, uh, may have some usable vision but generally doesn't read print visually. Um, there's some overlap there but the tools are, are slightly different. There's a few million people with color vision anomalies. We don't generally um, lump those in with people with partial vision or low vision, but there's a lot of them. And I'll talk about that and uh, what we do for them in a moment. There's folks with mobility and dexterity impairments. I 
think of these as two primary groups. One is those with muscular control or uh, nervous system issues where accuracy may be an issue and people with um, strength or fatigue issues where they may have um, super fine grain motor control, but they can't uh, lift things or move a mouse a lot because it's fatiguing, that kind of thing. Um, the, um, the big four I mentioned, dyslexia, ADD, anxiety, depression, and uh, PTSD, and depression. Those are the ones that are most common. And then we put uh, other cognitive impairments, learning disabilities under that same group. Then deaf and hard of hearing is its other separate group of two um, subgroups. People who have some hearing ability will tend to have greater literacy in English or the local language. And then people who have no useful hearing will tend to have stronger language abilities and sign language are more likely to be the case in it. So for the big four, the most common accommodation request is more time on assignments, on exams, whatever. Um, one general theme I would like to leave you with is that testing people's knowledge or ability to do things based on how quickly they can do it is something that should generally be retired. I mean, it just doesn't help to uh, evaluate people based on how quickly they can do something. Um, requests for extended time can vary greatly. I at one point thought, well, could we just make it a one and a half time switch? And it doesn't really work that way. Some people need just a little bit of extra time. Some people need additional hours. So if you can structure your coursework so that it's very flexible on when something is due, that's beneficial. However, there are some folks who have an issue getting things done on time. So deadlines are still useful. If you make everything due at the end of the course, um, that's not gonna be beneficial to everyone. So structure with flexibility is the general theme. There are some folks who have uh, language issues, maybe dyslexia and the like, who may have in uh, public school a scribe assigned to them, or in, even in higher ed, sometimes they will have someone who can write for them, take notes for them, and the like. I haven't bumped into any of these folks in the last few years. Maybe some of, the, of you can tell me your experience with this, but it hasn't translated into online education for me personally. I'm curious what your experience is. I know that they're out there. I just, it, I'm just telling you the incidence so far for me has been pretty low with online ed. Um, folks who have uh, print reading disabilities, any of these that I mentioned may also use um, speech output tools. I have a friend who's got a JD MBA from Stanford. He was getting really slogged down, down doing the law school part until he figured out that, uh, well, he knew he was, had severe dyslexia, but until he figured out that JAWS, a tool that was made for blind people, worked really well for him and that enabled him to finish. So um, in the years since he, he did that, um, the number of tools that are for uh, people with dyslexia and print reading uh, impairments has proliferated quite a bit. Uh, the general features are uh, read the page to me, read the thing under the mouse, um, read the paragraph or the selection, that kind of thing. So it's like a screen reader for blind people, but with a reduced, uh, most frequently used function, uh, set of functions. Blind people use screen readers as a program that runs in the background or in the browser that will read the content of what's on the screen or output it to Braille. Braille output is less common than you might think. There are these computers as I have a picture here that the, the refreshable braille, and one might think that would be super useful, and it can be, but it's also expensive, costs three, $4,000 for a braille display like this, and it's super useful if you intend to do something that involves uh, fine edit control, meaning like uh, punctuation. If you wanna be a programmer, get a braille display. If you wanna be a lawyer, probably a good idea too. If you wanna be an English major, um, maybe, maybe not, kind of hard to say, you can get by with speech. So there's an investment to learning Braille and to using refreshable Braille that you can get by without it in a lot of cases. Um, the accommodations that are needed by blind people are um, it, your, your system, the content should work with a screen reader and we try to make sure that the supported components in the platform are, I'll get to that more in a moment. Um, 
Images need text alternatives that are functionally replacements for the images. One of the most common issues we have in course content is actually the text alternatives are there. They're just not functional replacements. They're high level descriptions instead. And that doesn't quite, quite do it. Um, for math, the platform uses MathJax, but we have the possibility of do, using some other interactive methods at the moment. MathJax is a library, a JavaScript library that renders MathML, which is the language for describing math. Um, in higher ed, you will see a lot of math in MathML, but you'll see more in LaTeX, which is another output uh, language. So there's a way to take a LaTeX document, convert it to MathML. And generally, we encourage you any math content in courses should be in MathML. Then we know that it will work with MathJax or should. And um, that's kind of the lowest common denominator for that. There's another tool called MathCat, which is a MathML interpreter. And it's got some smart people behind it. I can't really say that it's stronger than MathJax or not at this point, but it's something I want to support in the future. If you're interested in MathCat, I'd like to talk with you. Um, the other thing for blind folks is um, they need alternate formats for handouts. So if you have EPUBs, document, uh, PDFs, Word documents, PowerPoints, those kinds of things, they need to be in accessible format. And accessible format at a very high level means it has structure to it in the way that HTML has structure. The kind of structure we're looking for is headings that are marked as headings, um, paragraphs that are marked as paragraphs, images that have text alternatives. Pretty much the same goals that we have in HTML exist in uh, document handouts. The other thing that documents give you though that you normally have in HTML is the ability to reflow. So if you take a PDF, which is primarily a print output format and it's properly marked up, there's a reflow mode in Acrobat Reader that will basically, it's like reader mode in uh, Chrome, will uh, redisplay the text, will um, shrink it to whatever available um, viewport width that, that are, there is there. So if you have print reading ability, but can't read tiny things or zooming isn't working, this will um, allow you to change the, uh, the display of it. Also, Adobe Reader has a speech output function. So if you want to say, read it to me, it'll read it in order and highlight things. So documents that we hand out need to be structured with semantic um, structures, as I say, headings, paragraphs, tables, et cetera. And that structure is something that is generally added to the end of the process of creating the documents. If you create a document, you add all the, the tagging, as I say. When you want to make edits, you have to go back and update the tagging. It's a little bit tedious. So in the workflow, tagging handouts is the last step. The other thing you can do is just don't do handouts and instead put everything in HTML. That's kind of the best case, but it doesn't happen all the time because there's a lot of, a lot of handouts in higher ed. Um, last thing or major category for blind folks is um, if you have video, and we have lots of it, um, if there's visual information in the video, that same information needs to be conveyed somewhere. Depends on what kind of information it is, what is the best way to convey it. So if you are teaching programming, for example, and there's a slide that has a piece of code on it, um, speaking what is behind the person isn't really going to be all that helpful or be difficult to interpret. Instead, what I would like, if I was a blind person, if somebody says, um, see slide five, and slide five is a document that I could pause the video, check out the slide, come back. So um, in some cases, what we need is basically annotations in the transcript that refer to a document that is random access. Um, in some cases, for video, the canonical accessibility is uh, uh, method is what they call audio description, which is a secondary audio channel that speaks the visual part. There's two kinds of audio description. So there's regular audio description that squeezes in the secondary audio of the other voice into the gaps where the primary speaker is not speaking. So it's um, sort of like there's someone sitting next to you and 
whispering in your ear. Um, the second kind of audio description is the same thing, except that if there's a bunch to be said, important details, the main track will pause while the extra voice is talking and then it'll carry out. Um, audio description is something that's really important in some contexts and really not important in other contexts. So it's very hard to make a big generalization about it, but it's a web content accessibility guidelines 2.0, meaning more than 10 years old requirements been there for a long time hasn't been adhered to very much and i'd like to fix this soon the primary reason it hasn't been adhered to very much in the last decade or so has been that it wasn't super readily attainable meaning video players didn't support it expert audio describers weren't available as a service and um, people didn't really know exactly how to do it those things are not true anymore if there are video players that support it we're going to be adopting one in the next year and there are services that want to provide these um, this function just as there are for captions so we'd like to provide it in the platform eventually don't necessarily need to go through the platform you can just work with somebody on your own right now but anyway audio description is something that needs to be become standard because we'd like blind people to be able to use course content on demand whenever uh, just as everybody else can. So the interesting part here in terms of administering the course is, again, audio description isn't just one solution for all content types. You have to look at the content type and say, what do I really want the experience for the learner to be here? And make certain decisions about what's, the, what's best for them. If I take videos teaching Python and I export them to one of the expert service providers that does audio description, I'm sure they'll describe what's in the back. I don't think it's gonna be super useful. So somebody's gotta make an executive decision basically say, what's, what do we want the learning experience to be? Um, if my description right now hasn't been clear enough where um, you, know, you can infer what would be good and what wouldn't, let's work together more on that. I can give you a little bit better advice. Um, I think if you crank up a screen reader and try to figure it out on your own, it probably makes sense how this uh, can be optimized. But generally speaking, I think if you need to do extensive editing or reading in detail, having canonical audio description is not really the best learning solution. And rather we should be putting annotations in the video or using one of the other um, types of annotations that we can enable with a new video player. Talk about the video player for a moment. So we our video player right now is grown over time and um, it's missing a couple things for accessibility. One is web VTT is a captions format. It uh, allows styling of the captions. You can place text where you want on the page instead of just all coming out at the bottom. So if there's something important at the bottom of the screen, which happens sometimes, if you don't want the captions running over it, it's just, it's a usability issue. Another thing you can do with styling is you can position the text have different colors just to separate speakers like one speaker to another speaker, that's somewhat useful too. Anyway, current video player doesn't support web VTT. We wanna add that in the next year. Um, we're gonna be working with T-Krill, who's basically overhauling the video player to use video.js, which supports web VTT, also supports audio description as another language option. So I'm hopeful that at the end of 2023, we'll be basically up to the state of the art with regard to video playback and then the next step you know, with that is to enhance the, the platform so that we make it easier to get audio description or those other functions, annotation, et cetera, into um, the platform automatically with as little effort as possible. Okay, that one is about as sticky as they get them. So anybody got any questions on blind user you know, features? <laughs> Go ahead. We, we also support YouTube hosting. Yeah. Well, what I have just been outlining is, you know, what would you do for teaching a blind person Python? When I say annotation, I'd take the SRT file, which is really a text only caption file and just right in there, I would put, um, 
whatever, you know, in brackets put, you know, C slide five, for example, and then have a file on that page that links to slide five so that it's easy to find. Um, in the spec that defines how uh, audio description works, there's there's a way you can do a text only file that is just an, that is basically annotations, like I just said, where where it says C slide five, it would be spoken in a different voice, and our video our current video player doesn't do that. So I would say as an interim solution, put that same annotation in the the primary you know, caption file, and then later we would have that. Uh, that markup as separate SRT file, um, and it would just come out as a separate voice. Hope that's clear. Any other questions about blind user access? This is a really quick skin, but these are the, the main bullet points that we need to cover. Um, okay. So mobility and dexterity, um, there's two primary things for this. Uh, one is additional time, like say, if there's a fatigue issue, might require more time to get something done. The other one is uh, there's voice input. Uh, the, the other part about mobility dexterity is the mo most common uh, disability, at least for quite a while anyway, is uh, repetitive strain injury. So lots of people who can't use their wrists want to use voice input instead. Um, <clears throat> we don't generally have to do a whole lot for voice input, but I'm putting it here as a potential thing for testing because we do find some interesting things with testing occasionally, usually around labels and stuff. So if you want to say click the OK button or click the submit button, there, you have to use conventional programming practices to do that. Um, just something to verify that it works. There are other keyboard alternatives, but the lowest common denominator is can you use a keyboard to ac access the thing? And if you got that, generally is this. Um, section of accessibility is taken care of. Okay, deaf and hard of hearing people. Video captions. So captions are um, legally required, adamantly, meaning if you have videos on the platform, they don't have captions, you're gonna get in trouble. That's how we got in trouble originally with some of the videos didn't have captions. Um, I wanna make it clear that you, it's like waving the flag in front of the bull if you put videos on a course that don't have captions. Um, I do want to clarify, though, there's a spectrum of abilities in the hearing impaired community, deaf and hard, hard of hearing, and some folks who didn't grow up with English because their parents were deaf, and they grew up with sign, sign is their native language, <clears throat> and then they learn English, maybe if they got some extra support if they were lucky, or if they basically had a, a school that could teach them both, or parents who had enough time to work with them basically a privileged minority of a, of a smaller minority of this larger group. Um, there are on the other end of the privileged spectrum, people who didn't get that rich environment. So they had sign only, or they had some sign if they were lucky. There's a language deprivation problem within the hearing impaired community overall. So when that kid who didn't get language exposure as much as most people do, comes to school, there's generally a focus on let's get them up to speed on signing as much as we can, as quickly as we can. Secondary emphasis on learning English and vision and um, reading. So the interesting part about this is that <clears throat> to accommodate the full range of people, if we provide captions on everything and they're 100% perfect captions, it's not the best solution for a bunch of this minority of hearing impaired people because their native language is signing. If you want to do, you know, stellar accessibility, consider providing sign language as an alternative, just as we would um, audio description for blind folks. Now, today that would mean creating a separate video link. And then, again, our player doesn't support that so well for languages, but the new player, VideoJS, next year's player, will support languages in this way. So I'm hopeful that in 2024, some of our best courses will have English, um, English with audio description, English with sign interpretation. So we'd have video with a, a video inset of someone interpreting that. Um, there's other sign languages, of course, and speaking language is generic, but 
we can treat sign language as another language. And I think the best, most accessible solution that if you wanna knock it out of the park is provide signed interpretation as well. You don't have to legally, but I'd really, I think we, it's attainable for our basically top tier courses at least. Or if somebody requests you, you got a deaf person comes to you says, oh, you know, signs my native language. I think it, maybe we should talk to them and get and see if it's affordable and readily attainable. Go ahead. I was just wondering about this new language program. Is that the uh, Deaf Input program? Is that the video link for the Sign Language Assistance for Others? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So um, there's different ways of doing signing. Um, some folks at IBM about three years ago did some research on this and they took one video image with high resolution and they had the signing person as the larger part of the image and the thing being interpreted as a smaller part. And um, that works really well. Uh, if you have high enough resolution, it's, it's not hard to do except for phones. Um, if you do two images or two you know, video streams, technically possible, the ABLE player from the University of Washington handles that. I've seen demos of it. I don't think VideoJS does that. Um, so it might be that we just recommend one video stream with you know the picture burned into the picture um, with sufficient video quality. And I think that might be what we need to do. I, I don't think there's really a compromise there. I'm just saying that um, VideoJS isn't a does everything solution, but it does that well enough. I, um, it, it'll just be a... Um, best practices type of situation there, I think. Okay, I just want to, big vision here is, I want to see signing everywhere eventually. It's, it's just, we need to think about how to get there. And the, the two pieces are one supported as a separate language in the video player, which we're pointing at. And then the other one will be, as we do with captions and we will do with audio description, I'd like to have another checkbox in the studio that says, give me a signed interpretation of that as well, if you want to pay for it or pay for it, right? So. so low vision people's uh, needs are basically, um, low vision folks will use magnification to make it easier to read print and also will do things to change the colors on screen if there's insufficient contrast. Um, the, the web content accessibility guidelines have kind of lowest common denominator or basic level of contrast that any content should have. But then on top of that, we want to be able to support tools that will remap those colors either with their own operating system tools or with a browser extension, something like that. Uh, like uh, high contrast mode is a Windows feature, but there's also high contrast browser extensions you can use. And um, so readability is a question of make the text readable then. There are some um, tools for partial sighted people that will um, actually take the text that's on the screen, redraw the font and make it, you know, multiple inches high on the screen and reflow the whole thing. Um, I don't see that used as often. If you find this common with um, learners, I'm curious, but I've, I've only seen this with older people who have specialized tools for that. But anyway, just putting it out there. So it, it, there's an interesting overlap between the enabling for magnification and enabling for screen reading. So, um, why are we doing this? No, backing up. Uh, civil rights. So people have legal and moral right to access education as much as anybody else. And the interesting part about online education is we can enable it better than we can in person. So we're in this interesting room here. If I had a wheelchair, I'd have to come in this entrance, right? Um, but if I had a mobility impairment, just getting here might be something of an issue every day. It might be super fatiguing. If I can work from home, that's just a, that might be a game changer. There might be a whole bunch more people coming into uh, education soon just because it's not as much of a lift to get there. Similarly, that 12% or so, that big number, big target of the big four, it might be that there's a whole bunch, in fact, I think it's highly likely, there's a whole bunch of people who think of themselves as just kind of slower than the rest of us for one reason or another. Um, maybe they thought they were slow readers and they didn't get a, a dyslexia diagnosis. Maybe they thought they could, didn't have a great memory or something because, and they had, just didn't yet get an ADD diagnosis, something like that. There's a bunch of folks who can do education 
who learned that they couldn't because they didn't have the right support at some time. So we are early in this game. We are at a point where we have enabling technology that is super underutilized. So if you think 10 years from now, our numbers in terms of prevalence of people with disabilities in education might be higher. And there's no reason to think that it might be higher than 12% penetration in the online space. Basically, online education is its own accommodation. It's basically the door is open, there are other places it's not. All right, and another thing about this is for you know the last hundred years, accommodating people with disabilities in education has been kind of a one-off thing. It's a, um, we'll figure out how to serve your needs when you present yourself in a short amount of time, if we can manage it, if somebody's spent, you know, is willing to spend money on it. The model for online education can be entirely different where we spend a nominal amount of money on the front end when you're doing course content creation and then just pack them in. <laughs> I mean, once you've done that work, you've done it for everybody. So if we have courses that are blind user accessible, that are low vision user accessible, I wanna go out and sell this thing. I can't, haven't been able to do that yet because we haven't got golden examples to point to. And there's a little bit of a risk when we do this where um, various different communities have very well justified skepticism about different efforts. So when you start waving a flag saying, hey, I made something for you, they're gonna look at it with a skeptical eye. I totally expect that. But nonetheless, I mean, this is, super opportunity. We are changing the way things are gonna be done here. So part of the reason why I'm giving this talk is I wanna encourage you to be in the first group of courses that we bring a lot of attention to, that we te do test marketing for, because um, it's gonna get much bigger over time, but we need to kind of pave the road in, in mm -hmm. sensible um, steps. Um, it really depends on the subject domain. Uh, some things I think, like everything in English, I think you can say the base version can be the accessible version. You don't need to do any specialization. For certain things, um, we're going to have to go out of our way to do some extra effort and maybe some innovation. Like I personally am ignorant about how to teach chemistry to blind people. I know it can be done. In fact, I know the language that you use for math and L can be used to describe chemistry function. And that's all I know. I mean, th there's more that can be done in that area. I've seen interesting tactile graphics and stuff like that. And I personally am working with a charts company on how to make charts accessible because I think it's super important. But the, um, the point is that it's a Venn diagram. So there's a bunch of things where I think uh, everything should just be fully accessible and it's not a heavy lift to do that right away. And then there's certain things where a little bit of work is gonna need to be done. And then there's a smaller set where I, I don't know the answer. Maybe I need to defer to some people who've gone down this road before. Um, so when we are selecting, who do we wanna focus on? Which, uh, you know, large classrooms do we wanna funnel a bunch of people into? Um, probably we will be biased towards certain subjects. And those biases show up in like in other, um, attendance figures like, I know a, dis, a disproportionate number of blind lawyers because it's all text <laughs> and um, it works, right? It's not gonna slow you down. Um, so let's think about that. I don't know. All right, any other questions or anything? Right. I think I cover this. All right, so back on the legal thing. Um, pretty much the developed world has laws requiring that online education be accessible. Um, the, I, I intentionally skipped over the references here, just trust that that's the case. Um, there's a weird situation where 
the world has converged on the web content accessibility guidelines for web-based content and for, for distributable documents. And most of the world actually has reg regulations that refer to those same guidelines. So they're pretty solid. Um, the US is a laggard in this regard in that we have a couple of rulings in higher courts or district courts that say the ADA covers the web and we've got one dissenter in a really unfortunate Supreme Court that might not go our direction. And, but the interesting point about the US is that um, everyone knows what accessibility means. It means conforms to WCAG 2.1 at the AA level or better. And it's not in the regulations right now. Let's treat it like it is. It's, you'll satisfy everybody in the world if you just hit that target. And then there's a few other things we can do to support those tools and stuff that um, the additional tools, the high contrast mode, the um, dark mode, things like that, but web content accessibility guidelines, 2.1, 2.2 soon, maybe next month. Uh, those are the targets that I work with every day. Um, okay, so uh, there's always a little bit of skepticism about who, who do we really expect to perform here? Or what, what do we really expect of people? And I, I just wanna pause and say that I think our society is about halfway to where it needs to be in that, um, there's a lot of folks who don't really have very high expectations of, of folks with big D disabilities as I say, you know, prominent noticeable disabilities. They're just kind of internally consciously or unconsciously. And I think, well, this isn't gonna come to much. Might be a, uh, not justified with <laughs> spending our resources. I mentioned the civil rights thing first because uh, return on investment is not the name of the game here. It's table stakes. It's the cost of doing business everybody has a right to this. And if it costs disproportionately more to educate someone with disabilities, then uh, the question is not did, did that person pay for themselves, but rather was it readily attainable? And it's very clear it's readily attainable. And anyway, back to what should we expect of people? Um, I wanted to talk about some friends. Uh, on the left here, this is Chauncey Fleet. She's got a PhD and I don't even remember what but she's my favorite geek at the moment because she's really interested in factor graphics and charts and is gonna help me make um, general purpose charts accessible to everyone. Uh, the second guy there is Larry Skootkin. He created the first screen reader for the Apple IIe because he needed it to get through high school. Um, the third guy here is a mathematician who's got a Rhodes Scholarship and such, uh, and he's also blind. The lady on the end there um, is, Bill Rhodes, um, she died last month. She's one of my professors, one of the smartest people I ever met. Um, <laughs> I don't think of her as a, having a disability, but it came up recently because I was reading about her. Um, she had uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis from teenage years on. And I remember her sitting in her office um, rocking back and forth all the time, which diminished this chronic pain thing that she had all the time. And I think about her in this case, in this scenario, because there's a lot of people like Dell who might not have bothered to go to college and become an outstanding professor, right? So everybody with some sort of a disability has a role in society. My strong default assumption is that everyone can be a contributor unless proven otherwise, pretty much equally. I'll get more um, details about that in a minute. Um, So there's this big question that I would like to answer before I retire, which is what's the return on investment for online education in terms of job rehab? So every state has a rehab agency. Their job is if you get a disability is to get you a job, teach you skills, get you back into the, uh, the game, so to speak. What we've just outlined today is, as far as I can tell, pretty affordable way to do that or probably affordable, right? I would like to sell online education as rehab. I think it might be a game changer. It might be a cash cow too. I'd like to go after that. So when I was talking about, you know, let's pick the top tier courses of the easy low hanging fruit, make them the best, most accessible things that we can, and then start funneling people with, who you know, have different types of disabilities into them as rehab programs. It's like, we can do this right now. We need the courses that are basically um, optimized for this, and then we'll go do some outreach to different organizations. There's another angle on this. 
Um, some countries have specialized agencies that do things too. For example, in Spain, they have the Spanish National Organization of the Blind. 75 years ago, the king gave this agency what was at the time a monopoly on the lottery. So in Spain, you go to any town, there's somebody selling lottery tickets, blind person in what we used to call photo mat booth. Photo mat was where you took the pictures, if you remember. Well, anyway, um, the um, blind people are integrated into society in Spain in a way that they are not here. Because they do when they run the lottery, it's a $4 billion a year business. They have more money than they need for everything. It's glorious. I want to go to Anse and say, um, I've got a bunch of Spanish courses. Can we like test them? Like, can we pave the, the, the road first? And um, we can work with them. I, they also have a huge tech team and do in, interesting, innovative work and stuff like that. So there are people who have resources outside the, you know, job rehab that we can work with to um, change the game effectively. Um, and so my pitch is, do you want to be first? Let's work to it. So, oh, last thing about the rehab thing. <laughs> Texas is interesting, not the place I would have guessed. If, if you have a diagnosis of hearing or vision impairment in Texas, you can go to a state funded college for free if there is room in the class. University of Texas, Austin is one of our partners. <laughs> so let's test that, you know, and if it works, I mean, let's go get that model adopted by every other state, right? I mean, again, it's like, why not? Let's go after it. Um, I'm gonna pause for a moment. Any questions? I'm gonna get into details of course content in a second. Yeah, um, it's been spinning my head around lately. I, I think there's a lot of potential, but um, I expect to be surprised and uh, the spinning to continue for a while. Um, <laughs> uh, I do wanna be clear that I don't think it's a magic wand though. So the, one of the first things that we've tried a couple years ago, or not we tried, but the industry has tried is automatic description of images. And I have a strong skepticism about automatic description. Um, and it comes to this question of what is the level of description that is needed. So the functional need is that the image or the description be a replacement effectively for the image. And the question then is what's really relevant in it. Sometimes there's rich details. Sometimes the purpose of the image is to tell a story, to set a mood. Sometimes it's to convey a very specific message. and it's easy to overshoot or undershoot. Most AI right now undershoots. The most recent innovations with chat GPT in particular and um, some of those completely changed the game in that you can say, for example, um, give me a description of this image in 50 words, exactly 50 words, and it'll do that. And that just blows my mind. Um, so it might be that in some hackathon, we're gonna have one in April, by the way, um, we could have a, a, a slider that says, give me a description in 10 words, 50 words, 100 words. And with a slider like that, you can cover it. You can get the information, I would guess, maybe 80% of the time. But I know there's a bunch of images in our course content library, or even that's not going to work. It's like you, you really need someone who knows what the message was supposed to be to write several paragraphs to convey the information that was in that image. And I don't expect AI to cover that. It's, it's the, the core problem with AI things is signal detection. And um, there are two types of errors every time you use them. <laughs> um, so there's potential there. We're just scratching the surface. I expect to have different opinions a year from now. Um, I, I'm excited about it, but uh, circling back to what I said earlier, expect all of the advocates to have strong skepticism about anything you put out there. Um, some of our competitors went straight into automatic description of images, and I'm not going to do that. It's got to be more nuanced than that. Um, I don't, 
I don't think we're going to alleviate the need for somebody who knows the domain a little bit to describe images anytime soon. So, yeah. Questions? Questions? These are the major chunks of uh, what I think about in terms of course content accessibility. There's edX supported Xbox, the other Xbox, you know, today or at the conference, or you'll see lots of different things demonstrated, and there's a bunch of them online. And um, so, if it comes with the box effectively, uh, we support it, and it's my job to make sure it works. And if it doesn't come with the box, then it's going to be your responsibility to make sure it's accessible. And I want to give you a general idea of what, how to do that. Um, there are chunks of HTML, which is probably number two after video content in terms of what we see used all over the place. There's the ability to apply custom CSS and JavaScript for a few different purposes. Um, and I wanna talk about an accessibility tab, which I think should be standard practice. Um, edX supported Xbox. So I wanna be clear, our goal is that Everything in the platform is WCAG 2.1 AA level conformant. Most of it is right now. There's a couple of Xbox where some of the CSS is um, not following 2.1 yet. And those things are in the queue to be updated to React components in 2023. So I think it will happen eventually. At that same time, we will probably be adapting WCAG 2.2 at the AA level, which is supposed to be finalized next month. I've been following the development of WCAG 2.2 for you know, too long. And um, I don't think there'll be any particular difficulties except for this one thing, which is that there's a new requirement that you should be able to drag and drop without actually dragging. So a person with mo mobility impairment should be able to do this basically, instead of, which requires too much dexterity. And um, keyboard accessibility doesn't get you off the hook with that. So we have, a version two drag and drop component right now. We're gonna need a version three. It's not a huge rev, but it'll be in the queue for the year. It won't be done in April. I'm just saying that's on my radar. Um, so I expect there's a little fuzziness that we will be conformant with WCAG 2.2 AA at the end of 2023. Vaguely, that's the general target. Um, I um, intend to use the same strategy for WCAG 2.2. <laughs> that we have used for 2.1, which is that we're gonna get to that when that thing comes around again, or if it's low hanging fruit, basically in good time, we will get to it. We think it's you know useful, but it's it doesn't become a priority one thing just because the committee finally finished their, their guidelines. It's, it, it comes through um, in prudent amount of time. Um, okay, so let's say you wanna use something else that is not in the box, so to speak. You want to first check out its accessibility uh, since you have these legal requirements like we do, um, ask them if their product's accessible. This industry standard way of doing that is you say, can I have your VPAT? And VPAT is a voluntary product accessibility template. And that's this document that the US government came up with to answer the question of, are you conformant with the WCAG guidelines plus some extra stuff if you want it? And the answers are yes, no, or partially. If somebody hands you a VPAT and it says yes for every one of the questions, you usually don't know what they're talking about or they're lying. Um, every good VPAT has some extra words in it and gives you details that is nuanced and basically it's a moving target. So you should expect there should to be something that isn't perfect. Um, we have a VPAT, you can have it on request. We don't put it out publicly just because, well, it is a moving target. I update it fairly regularly whenever somebody asks, asks for a new one. Anyway, increasingly I've noticed quite a bit. I mean, it's a steep ramp. Um, pluggable things, LTI components, stuff like that. VPATs are usually uh, available. So if somebody uh, in, is creating new course content and they have a number of widgets available to them. Some of them are probably more likely to be strongly accessible than others. And I would encourage you, since you're legally required to, to put some priority on the accessibility of those things. And the VPAT is the primary you know, evidence to you is, is this thing gonna work or not? Having said all that, it's not a perfect tool. You need to do your own testing to verify the information they give you. 
Okay. Text and HTML, of course, uh, blocked. So the video is, you know, primary thing. Got to do captions. Try to do audio description or whatever's you know, needed for that, and then text things. And if you create text in the component, generally it's um, accessible, mostly accessible. But it's an HTML thing, so it's got a lot of possibility for doing the wrong thing. I've skimmed through quite a bit of course content. The things that I see most commonly are people will get a little bit confused about what to do about headers. I'll dig into that in a minute. Um, people will create styled text chunks that look like headers, but they're not marked up as headers. That's a common thing in the wild anyway. Sometimes people will use images instead of headers, which is also unfortunately common out there. Basically, we want structure, use header tags for headers. Um, try not to put text in images if you can avoid it, that kind of thing. Um, used to be that we reserved H1 and H2 for the platform and then asked course content authors to stick to H3 and H4. Then we changed the platform, we stopped using H2. So there's an H1 and that skips to H3 and it's breaking one of the general rules for um, headings. So first message is you can use H2 now, please do. Second is we're going to be adding H2 to the heading menu there, although you can add it using the HTML editor. Next message is those headings you see right there, those are gonna go away. Um, Gabe's gonna give us some news. <laughs> we have a heading hierarchy in the, the Paragon design system that we use pretty much everywhere and it's gonna be adopted here. Right now you have a discontinuity between the platform marketing pages and the user interface pages and all that, the headings that we use there. And then we have these 14 year old heading styling in the learning content. We're gonna update that. So all that's gonna be happening in the next couple of months. Um, okay, I created a widget for one of our partners, uh, a, a piece of JavaScript that basically if you've used H1, uh, which we ask you not to, it'll bump it down to H2 because H2 is available on it. And if you didn't use H1 and you just went to H3, it'll slide everything up to H2 and everything looks good. It's changing ARIA so that it's not changing your visuals. It shouldn't be disruptive at all, but I'll give you this piece of JavaScript if you want to use it. Um, there's another thing that is uh, changed is uh, styling of inline links um, has been inconsistent. So it's a good practice to, if you have a link that opens a new tab, that little icon, um, the standard one is a box to the northeast pointing arrow. And that means either this is an external link or this is a um, thing that opens a new tab and our design team has standardized on a couple different icons for those. It's not in the platform yet, but will be in the next couple of months so that when you're uh, creating links, these icons will be applied automatically. Again, I created a little piece of JavaScript that does that in the interim. And if you want it, I'll give it to you. Um, it'll be, happen automatically. The last thing I wanted to emphasize after what I was saying a moment ago about text alternatives and the trouble that they have is um, sometimes an image, like a chart diagram, flow chart, something like that, really needs paragraphs. It doesn't need, you know, some thing that fits in a tiny edit control. And the way to do text images, my preference anyway, is screen reader on the text. So you go to the text editor or the HTML editor, turn on the HTML view, so you're seeing the code. You create a div with class equals SR, that's my screen reader then type anything you want in there. It can be as long as you want. And that will be seen by the screen reader. Just put it right below the image. Gets around the, the lim, um, size limitation. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know anywhere where it's not there. There's a few places where we used to use SR dash only. It's actually, the SR is borrowed from Bootstrap and we use Bootstrap pretty much everywhere. Um, so it's, it's there now. Um, there's a, a problem editor component where we added a new widget in the uh, tiny MCE is our search text editor, add a new widget so that you can actually select text, click the button and it'll make it screen reader only. It's um, so you don't have to do the HTML editing. Okay. 
um, language of parts. Another thing that we don't do enough, we meaning we, um, there's a WCAG 2.0 requirement that says it, the, the page should have a language defined in the HTML element, um, lang equals, let's say, en. And then if you have something that's not English in that page, it's, it should be marked lang equals whatever it is, de for German, for example. Um, doesn't happen. I mean, uh, we don't see this happening a whole lot. Um, so it's easy to apply. There is, there is a requirement to do that. And uh, there's a context menu is going to be coming in the text editor soon because it's part of Tiny MCE and their, um, their effort to invest more in accessibility is appreciated here. So expect to see that soon. But you can make the, the change in the HTML now if you want to. Last thing I want to mention about HTML content is Tiny MCE has their own accessibility checker, uses the axe rules, the axe core rules, which are kind of everywhere. That may make it a little bit easier to check accessibility, but you can use other tools, which I'll mention in a moment anyway, um, already today. The last thing is um, it's a good idea when you're creating post content to shrink the window size down to 320 pixels, because that's the smallest it should fit in if it's possible. If it's a table, it doesn't have to, but generally if you can make it fit in 320, it's WCAG 2.1 conformant then for a roof layer. Any questions on HTML content? Because uh, unavoidably this is kind of a skim over what is usually a, a bit of a landmine. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a um, yeah, how about at the end? That's probably, yeah. So something I would like to encourage as a standard practice is um, when you create a course, make a custom tab just for accessibility. Uh, I put one in one of my courses just as an example there. That's the way it would appear to the learner. And the primary benefit of this is that if you are looking for accessible information, I think this is the easiest way to find it. Now, some people are going to get a learner support and help and that kind of thing. And we can help them out that way too. But if you put all the key accessibility information in one place, I think it will go a long way towards smoothing the path and normalizing the experience and making things accessible for everyone. Let's talk about what should go in the accessibility tab. Whole bunch of stuff. Talk about your commitment to accessibility. Say we did this for you. We are making doing making our best effort to make this content usable by people with disabilities. Um, link it to your institution's accessibility policy page if you have one. It's probably pretty much saying the same thing as everyone else, but still assert your commitment to the cause. Um, mention who to contact if you have questions or an issue. Now the default is there's an accessibility at edX.org email address. And if you want to have that be your, your primary method of contact, that is fine with us. Any questions come in, I see them, the learner support people see, see them, and we will vet them basically to say, is this a platform problem or a um, content problem or the learner doesn't understand the tools or something like that. It's, it varies all over the place, but I don't mind being the first filter or having us see it first. But if instead you want them to email the instructor or to go to your institution's accessibility team or something like that, make that clear here so that the number of steps they have to go through to get to a resolution is minimized. Okay. Um, if you have accessible versions of handout files, uh, make it clear where they are. So if it's the same file, which is sometimes the case, uh, make it clear that's what the what is happening here. Say all the PDF files are marked up or, or tagged for accessibility or something like that. If you have different versions, like Capital One, for example, the bank has, you can download your statement as a PDF or you can download it as an accessible PDF. Seems stupid to me, but they do, I, anyway, uh, separate links. If you wanna have separate links, go ahead and do that. Just make it clear so they don't have to ask. Um, same thing with audio description. So today the video doesn't include an audio description or video play doesn't include the, the option. So if they need to go to a different link or do a different thing to get the, the, the visual information, 
like if they need to open the transcript and read the transcript to find the annotations for that information, make that clear in here. Um, if you did any accessibility testing, mention which tools you used, which platform it was, which version of the tools. All these things are actually relevant um, to testing because not everything works with everything. Um, okay, this is another thing that I will be focusing myself on in the next year, but you can do some of this too if you want. So there's a bunch of domains that are basically um, ready to be fully accessible. Coding is one because it's text editing intensive. Um, but if you drop an 18 year old who knows how to use a screen reader into a coding class, they need to learn coding environment and its quirks by keyboard through screen reader, as well as learning the subject matter kind of at the same time. So it's a steep ramp. The MIT Open Courseware group has a class they call the missing semester, which teaches you a bunch of stuff that they wish everybody knew before they came to MIT. I wanna have a missing semester for people with disabilities. We have right now a course that's learning online um, or how to learn online. I wanna have how to learn online for people with disabilities. So if you wanna learn how to code, you need to learn how to use Visual Studio code because somebody's gonna teach, teach it to you. And we have certain um, coding testing things where you, you know, there's a problem, you enter some code and it evaluates it for you. Some of them are more accessible than others. Anyway, you should be able to get through all the tools accessibly before you get into the course to learn the material that's gonna require those tools. So um, this is gonna be one of my own projects over time, but if you wanna be working on these little modules, I'd be happy to include outside contributors into this course. I'm just saying, if you have any of that, or if you wanna to link to other relevant tool information like the hotkey or the, um, Hotkey sheet for Zoom, put a link to that in the accessibility tab. All right, here's another one. We still have some talks of the design and trying to some coding. Sometimes we're giving away certificates and that costs a lot of money and we, you know, the bar is higher for verifying your identity. The proxy tools that we use occasionally have configuration issues that might pre pre prevent accessibility issues. <coughs> It's another one of those things too, where familiarity with the environment helps a lot. So I would consider it basically required that someone who uses accessibility technology should go through a demo or a, a, an evaluation proxy exam before the actual proxy exam. We encourage this everywhere in our documentation. We just wanna make it very clear it's not really optional. You're gonna have trouble with a bunch of people with disabilities if they haven't tried the proxy exam before the actual proxy, proxy exam. <clears throat> so nail that in the accessibility tab so that, that you should be doing this well in advance, not the day before. Okay. Um, now, another thing about best practice is everyone comes to the online situation and says, is this, is this really gonna work? And you wanna answer that question here and say, yeah, it's gonna work. And by the way, a bunch of people are coming to coding. And for people who have this type of disability, meet here in the monitoring center. Right? They have a Discord group for this or we have a question and answer thing every week on in the discussion group. Or whatever you wanna do, I would encourage you to basically have something substantive in there that says, this is for you, let other people like yourself feel. It's very, very readily, it's very reasonable to think that within the next couple of years, anyone with a big D disability, like I say, will find more community online than they would in any college in person even the biggest state state schools. Um, but we need to organize that. We need to make it a conscious effort. Okay. Um, all right, I've noticed with regard, with regard to time extensions, um, it's not hard to give people more time on an assignment. It's not hard to give people more, more time on an exam or both in teachers. What people get um, bitten by is, um, because there's ADD, um, they go do the work, they come back and they're a week before the thing's ended and they wanna finish the score. And it's just not gonna happen, there's not enough time. And uh, even independent or learner directed courses will have a cutoff date at some point. And this is just the administrative reality. So you don't have to accommodate every extension request for the course. 
there's an ability to change the course end date so that you can give somebody a week or something like that. But changing that date changes it for everyone. So it's, it's kind of a heavy ask to say, give me an extra week. Um, what I would ask you to do is make that clear or plus the week. Um, that can be extended to ten, and what the criteria are for the grant for that. Um, now, when someone comes to us and says we have, have a disability that can be determined, um, edX as an organization doesn't go aside disability status. And I don't, I mean, if you ask different institutions around the world, you know, what is used to verify the candidates with disabilities, uh, I would ask you to strongly evaluate whether or not you really need to. Um, if you structure your exams in such, in a pretty flexible and accessible way, I think you, the question goes away a lot. A lot. So, um, nonetheless, if your institution for some reason wants documentation, I would make that clear up front. I, I, I think that should be required effectively, but if you're going to do it, then put that information in here. Um, if you have tutoring available, some of our programs have tutoring available. We would include information um, in about that here. If uh, there are external sources available that can get you through a program, and I personally find this thing very good, which is basically body by the answer, body by the answer. You can just book a meeting. There's five, six, eight people who show up in a meeting. You spend five minutes talking about anything and doing the next hour, work for 45 minutes, and that's the end of it. You, you say, what did you get done? And it's super great for getting, you know, focus. But it's 40 bucks a week here. So, I mean, where <laughs> it's cheap and cheap and productivity. And I, I actually think we should build it into the platform, like, you know, into our calendaring function so you can say, uh, person with ADD, just show up and do the thing that's on the calendar and you will get through it. Um, but we're, we're not there yet. Anyway. If there are services like this, mentioning them in your accessibility tab makes sense too. Any questions about this? This is kind of one of my major initiatives. So we'll see if we can get this thing going. Learner support. So um, let's see. Uh, clarify who to contact. You can use us if you want. Um, there should be a single point of contact so there's no confusion. Um, whatever it is, if somebody's, for example, if you tell people to post your questions about accessibility in the discussions group, that should be monitored daily. Don't make people wait to figure out what things are. Um, and then when they post things, respond promptly, even if you don't know the answer yet. So you know, we'll get back to you shortly. Um, and then, unfortunately, I include you don't know anyone. But, there's a minority of folks out there with di with diagnoses who think, well, this is extra hard for me. You should, you know, cut me some slack, and um, that's not what the law says. So, you know, we don't want brain surgeons that are given extra credit for because it was hard. Uh, um, typical accommodation requests, time ex extensions, biggest by far. Um, Occasionally, people will ask for extensions in courses, as I said. And then third or fourth is alternative formats for documents. And um, the alternative formats are usually relatively straightforward to produce. Occasionally, it depends on the materials where somebody needs specialized knowledge. But I think most of the time, we don't get too hitched, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, one, one thought is there's, um, we're, we're in a transition period where the traditional education model is um, someone presents uh, themselves early in the course and says, I have a disability, these are the kind of accommodations I'm accustomed to, they're gonna work for you. And they're 
there's a strong assumption that the instructor will say, sure, I can work with that because there's a relationship built with the, um, the uh, team at the institution that basically knows what they're talking about here. And, um, and then it's just adjusted as needed. Um, if you lean away from time requirements or you make super generous time requirements, then it diminishes the role of this kind of thing. Still, those people are gonna come to the course with a certain preconception to say, well, whatever your normal time requirement is, I usually need twice that. So you get in this kind of comical situation where maybe this exam takes somebody who knows what they're doing on average an hour, somebody with a severe physical impairment who's, you know, just because they're working with a keyboard and it's more burdensome to them, it takes eight hours, whatever. But you just say, look, you gotta get it done by Friday. And, um, and there's a hard requirement. And as long as you outline it up front, I think it kind of goes away, but it's just a messaging problem then instead of an accommodation problem. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, there, you might be surprised in the name, the, the range and the amount of time certain things take people. Um, and I, I think rarely have I seen a case where we really need to be more flexible or we couldn't be more flexible. It's a, it becomes just a uh, structure of the exams or the, the deadlines in such a way that there's plenty of warning and there's plenty of time available. Um, any other questions about something? Um, course administration. So um, distilling everything that, that down that I just said, if, if we front load accessibility work so that when you come to the, anybody comes to the course with a disability, it's pretty much the work's already done for them. And there's a strong assumption that um, they can get through it without additional specialized requests then the ideal situation when somebody asks, so how many people do you have in your 50,000 person course that have disabilities? The answer is going to be, I don't know, they don't complain. Um, right now, you know, people like Bill Rhodes who had a rheumatoid arthritis thing or whole adult life got through you know, life pretty well. Okay, didn't use a wheelchair that when I knew her, but she used a cane and basically that was kind of a pain in the butt to her every day but she got through. So it wasn't really relevant. On the internet, nobody knows if you have a disability. Well, on online education, the best answer is, I don't know, <laughs> because the, the road was clear for them. And it's gonna be more, I don't know, as we go forward. Now, when we get to a stage after we've cleared this road where um, we can start funneling more people with uh, disabilities into courses because we have strong confidence that the work's been done up front, um, then I think there can be interesting research done, which unfortunately will require random assignment to say, how did the online version compare to in-person in terms of results and, and such? And in those cases, then we might have to ask people to declare. Um, I'm not really against asking people to declare their disabilities if we have an interesting research question. Uh, I've been doing this particular domain for five years and I haven't had an interesting enough research question yet to ask people. Um, I personally wanna do another uh, research project to fix the color contrast algorithm for the W3C because it drives me crazy. Um, in, in which case I will need to recruit a whole bunch of people with vision anomalies. Um, but still, generally speaking, we don't have a good excuse to ask people if they have a disability. And there's also that other problem of a bunch of people would qualify for disabilities in different domains in different countries that where it depends on where you are. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is um, I expect that the best situation after the work is done is quiet. It's, <laughs> it's tons of work. Um, and I, I naively think we're in pretty good shape right now because we get relatively few requests. I realistically think that a lot more people need to get the message that online education is revolutionary. So, and I wanna start beating that drum. I just need to clear the path a little bit more for, yep. okay, 15 minutes. Okay, so things to do before launch, um, get all the captioning and audio description and annotations done for videos, uh, tablescapes. 
if you um, are going to have live sessions, I forgot to mention this earlier, you can have live sessions with a person with a hearing impairment. They will need CART service, CART's real time captioning um, or ASL interpretation. And you need to arrange that for them. And it's sometimes uh, tedious to, to get that arranged, but it's a legal requirement. So make it clear that person with hearing impairment needs to be to request that you don't have to provide it automatically for everything that is live um review the text in the html xbox which is pretty straightforward i think um add the accessibility tab as i mentioned it and populate it with the relevant info which is really a messaging thing not not coding or heavy lifting um Link into documentation for third party plugins and increasingly courses are using these kinds of things because the ecosystem is growing every year. And then if you're gonna be doing uh, marketing communications that involve diversity, which is uh, a good idea, consider including people with disabilities in the communication. But when you do that, be sure that it's actually gonna work. <laughs> Don't go out of your way to say, oh, the person with disability is taking our course and that's really darn sure it's actually gonna work the first time without a major impediment um, getting through it. Um, this is more just some references. We have some vendors that we've worked with and the, the, the set of them is actually pretty large. And these are some ones that I would recommend. We work with three plate the most, but and I think they might be the biggest in the US. Silla 24 and 3 player are built into the operating or into the, the platform. I'd like to go to that group and at some point, um, lots are interested. These same companies, by the way, tend to do uh, audio description for SEU too. Um, there is a collection of companies that will do document remediation. So you hand to them a PDF or a LaTeX file or EPUB or something like that to say make an accessible version and they'll hand it back to you. And uh, I think that in a lot of cases is the way to do it, um, right? or you can do it yourself. There's tools available too. Um, but if you do it without uh, super tight time crunch, it's cheaper. If you say I need this in 48 hours because I'm legally required to respond to this thing, then it's going to cost you more. Um, right in there. I have certain tools that I use for testing. Uh, I like the Arc Toolkit. It gives lots of nuanced warnings you don't actually need uh, in terms of conformance, but it gives you a deeper view into the thing. Accessibility Insights for Web is an extension made by Microsoft. Axe Dev Tools is a, uses a core set of rules that are common to a lot of the t different tools. I test with VoiceOver on Mac and iOS. I actually test with um, TalkBack on um, Android as well. We use NVDA and JAWS, and then occasionally we use drag and dictate. These are the tools we use. There's some others out there, um, some browser extensions and such, but um, I think if you were testing with these things, then you're covering the map pretty well. Um, I would deep dive into these things and I intend to in other documentation. I'm just kind of glossing right now to keep you on the line. Here. If you want to go the extra mile, if you can make things work with dark mode, that's great. We're going to have dark mode in the platform at some point, kind of incrementally getting closer to it. Um, but there are extensions that will give you dark mode now um, a little bit more crudely. Test things on mobile screens. And uh, because it's actually a technical uh, a legal requirement, also test for the Bluetooth keyboard on tablets. Um, right, and during the course, if you've done all the work, it should be quiet, it should be easy. So the things I have to mention here are basically respond to questions and accommodation requests and extend ex assignment deadlines as needed or practicable. There's, um, as I mentioned earlier, some learning domains where getting someone through it may be an interesting exercise. If, um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have more to offer there. Maybe you folks do. But um, for a lot of domains, this is pretty much what it's going to boil down to if you front loaded the work. Okay, that's all I have. 10 minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh.
Right. Um, we can pull it up, I suppose, if we, we want to be thorough here. Just one second. The shorthand in my in my head is not going to be a problem because we've thought about these things, but I want to be a little more thorough here. Um, the thing with the, the drag and drop is, um, so as it is right now, if you're using keyboard, you could land on something, you hit enter or space and it grab and you use arrows to move. Um, the, the only thing we need to do to our drag and drop is like on grab in grab state, show four buttons with arrows, and like you move the thing or something like that, depending on what the context is. Um, you should you should basically be able to tap in a tablet scenario without dragging. That's the requirement. Um, so there's another weird thing about WCAG 2.2, which is that um, some candidate guidelines, guidelines as they call the rules, make it through a multi-year process and then get cut off at the end. I find it very frustrating because they're not super forthcoming about. I mean, if you dig through GitHub issues, you can find out why something died, but there's not like this bullet in there thing where a postmortem says, well, that thing that you were really hoping would happen, here's why we couldn't do it. Um, usually it's the last step is practical uh, limitations. So for example, there was a guideline candidate that basically said, don't hide controls. Um, don't make a guess that I needed to do X to show the controls. And the case where this comes up most frequently is with video. Um, where if you pause for a second, the controls will go away to show you the rest of the video undisturbed. But it, there's other places too. Um, but there are tools, particularly like Figma and stuff, where there's a rich palette of tools and you'd like them to go away or you'd like them to only sh um, show up when the mouse is over, that kind of thing. That's typical trigger to show the, the tools that were hidden. And the concern is that people with certain cognitive impairments aren't gonna know what to do or uh, remember what to do. And so the, the, the gist of the rule was, don't make me guess. And not super hard to satisfy that one for our purposes. It was basically um, fiddling with the visibility of the controls in the video player or something like that. Um, really low hanging fruit. Uh, Adobe really didn't like that. <laughs> because in uh, some of their design tools, it was like, this isn't gonna, they couldn't figure out how to make it practical. Um, I personally would have said, all right, we'll make that a AAA requirement then. And people can still know that it's a good idea. Instead it got dropped, I don't know why. Um, really frustrating. There's another one uh, that has to do with the salience of focus styling. And I thought for sure this thing was going to go through. and. Right now it's marked as um, endangered or something like that. Like it's, it might not actually work. And the last week I was digging through the GitHub issues again. They were saying this might end up being a AAA or we could make it a AAA. They were actively considering um, softening the stance on that particular thing. So the, the salience or requirement there was basically focus styling pixels should have three to one contrast versus the background and also versus border pixels unless there's certain area covered, which was like four pixels wide on the smallest dimension or one pixel if there's a gap between, basically the, what we do in Paragon today satisfies the requirements. So I haven't been bugging you about this one because it's like, all right, we got that already. Um, I would have liked to have seen it actually make it through. I'm, I'm curious why, but they don't, they, they don't tell us. All right, let me find out what else is new in here just to cover this question. Focus not obscured. So there, there was one that basically says, um, if the thing has focus, it should be visible. Um, there's some instances where you could have in the viewport, uh, thing has focus, but there's another thing that's laying over it. So you need to not make that happen. 
Um, target size minimum. Uh, a lot of people argued over this one for a long time. The, as it states it right now, there's a 24 by 24 pixel clearance, no minimum size, but it should have 24 pixel clearance to hit the thing. Um, this one for the last decade, there people, there's a bunch of people who want 44 pixels. 44 is a lot harder to do in a lot of situations than 24. 24 is readily attainable. 44 is a good idea. And it made it as a AAA requirement in 2.1. Um, so I expect the 24 will be fine line. I, I don't think we have any problem with that particular one. Um, consistent health. Uh, this one's changed a bunch and I don't know if they make it either. So at one point they wanted the, a help thing in the same place on every page if it's practical. And we have a help link in the footer. And then the, the guideline for us or for edX is use the footer. There's a few pages we didn't bother to put a footer on. This is basically just use the footer. It'll have a link to help. Um, <clears throat> the, the concern here, the user experience is that sometimes you can get people lost and they don't know how to find help. And that should just never happen. So rel relatively easy to satisfy. Accessible authentication is, um, uh, it's been phrased different ways. Like um, basically people hate captures. Uh, so have a way to identify or to validate that you're human without remembering something or using vision or, um, yeah. So those things where you say, you know, click on all the things that look like an airplane, um, that wouldn't work. You need to have a, a separate way in addition to that. Um, redundant entry. Um, can't remember what redundant entry is. Yeah, I had internalized this as a 2.1 requirement. This one comes down to use the uh, the auto suggest attributes on form controls um, so that you don't have to type things twice if it's attainable. Anyway. So um, for six, seven years worth, or six years of, worth of uh, turning the crank, I, I didn't feel like there was a whole lot that was burdensome in this go around. Um, there's another effort to do what's called look like 3.0, which is um, more ambitious and it's more functional. Um, I wouldn't put a, any, the confidence interval for when they'll be done is years wide. Um, my main complaint, the, the, if I go to a, a team that knows nothing about accessibility, the, the, the elevator pitch is you need to satisfy look like 2.0. It's readily attainable and reasonable and cost effective. Everything except the damn color contrast formula is broken. It tells you to do certain things that you should not do. And it tells you you can't do certain things that should be just fine. And they need to fix that. So, all right, I got one minute. I'm just gonna stop now. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, so um, if it hasn't been obvious, this is something of a pitch to call <laughs> or to work with us. I, you all uh, you know, know people who make course content and I wanna throw a bunch of business at you. <laughs> people with disabilities. And I wanna do some research around these things. Um, first, we need to clear the path and make sure that uh, we have strong courses that can withstand close scrutiny. I have no doubt that this can be done. I don't think it is that heavy a lift. I just wanna say, let's get really clear on what that is and then be methodical about uh, market testing and user testing. And, and then once we have established this you know, is workable, and how to do it well, including um, supporting people as a community and not just as uh, accommodation requests, then we can scale it up. And I think this, this thing is gonna be um, a much more mature place in just a couple of years. Anyway, thanks for your time. <laughs>